So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this another episode of uh, Arthroplasty Conclave. And to begin with, I'll hand it over to Dr. Kiran Kara, the convener of the meeting. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashok, and uh, I welcome all of you in this uh, eighth episode of the Arthroplasty uh, Conclave. Uh, we had uh, Professor Ross Crawford speaking to us uh, on Sunday. Uh, where he talked uh, to us about uh, the cemented uh, Exeter hip replacement 50-year journey. And uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Surendra Patil, uh, I welcome uh, Dr. <coughs> Panchit uh, uh, Mahendale. Uh, Dr. Sanchit Mahendale uh, is uh, working in the UK and is in Bristol. He is... Uh, uh, working in the hip unit and has a lot of experience in primary, difficult primaries and revisions. He also performs hip arthroscopy. And today he's going to talk to us on how he tackles a difficult primary hip replacement in his practice. And he will talk to us for about 30 minutes. He will use his memorable cases and give us uh, examples uh, on how to deal with it. Following that, we've got uh, five cases uh, where different speakers will uh, showcase their memorable cases and we will try and see what we can learn from them. So uh, I also have on my panel, Dr. Nikhil Shah, Dr. Narinder Kumar, Dr. Vikas Kulshreshta, Dr. Gurinder Bedi. And uh, I welcome the speakers who have uh, also joined us, uh, Dr. Vishal Rajput, Dr. Santosh, and Dr. Dhariwal uh, at the moment. So. Without any further ado, I, I request uh, Dr. Sanchit Mahendale to start with his talk. Uh, you can start uh, sharing your screen, Sanchit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kiran and Ashok. Okay, so what I was hoping to share with you is my experience along the way in doing difficult primary total hip replacements. This may be something that may be new, but I suspect all of us have been confronted with these things in practice. And it is just my approach to dealing with these difficult primaries. Um, and I'll talk you through my sort of thought process as it goes. Uh, apologies if it's not complex enough, but I thought uh, I'd try and get a good mix. So we're based in Bristol, which is home to the Balloon Fiesta and the Concorde. But what I'm hoping to talk about is, in terms of a difficult primary total hip replacement, I thought we would consider it under three headings. So acetabular problems, and this, again, not frequently is seen back home, but the rapid acute destructive arthritis, in which the x-rays change dramatically within three months. And unfortunately, in the UK, the waiting lists are quite long, so patients deteriorate quite frequently in between sort of listing them and actually seeing them for surgery. And the main problem on the acetabular side, in my mind, is inadequate bone stock. So the contained defect or the segmental defects, either of them can pose a significant problem. Previous osteotomy, so we see lots of pediatric problems uh, which can have had Salter's osteotomy or Chiari's osteotomy, and that has its own difficulties when you deal with it, as the establishing the normal is quite difficult. And then the last bit on the acetabular side, which is what most of my work nowadays is, is the metastatic work. So where the bone stock is really poor and whatever you have is not strong enough to sustain the primary, support the primary. On the femoral side, there are multiple issues. So you have the leg length discrepancy. So the PFFDs and those sort of issues where it might be quite significant. You may have deformity due to either previous osteotomies or because of previous femoral fractures. In areas where the hip has been fused, the abductors come into the equation. If they're not sort of good quality or they have defunction, then the difficulty is that instability will become an issue. Again, with previous osteotomies, version is an issue. And then if you're trying to bring the hip down as in a crow three or four, then the sciatic nerve becomes an issue. And then you have the combined problem. So the ankylosed hip where bone stock is an issue, deformity is an issue, and so also leg length discrepancy again with DDH and metastases. 
And so we'll try and go through a few cases and try and work out, or I'll present my thought process in that. So how I do it, well, start off with the basics in orthopedics history and clinical examination. And the first thing I try and establish is, does the patient actually need a joint replacement? Once you've established that, you go on to the meticulous pre-op workup and planning, and that's where most of the challenges tend to be. We find the MDT discussions quite helpful, the multidisciplinary team meetings, and I'll talk a bit about that. And then we come to the informed consent and setting realistic expectations. And in certain scenarios, this becomes really important. Then we talk about go through the choice of components and what influences my thought process when I um, think about what I'm going to use. And some talk about state surgery. So do you do some metal work removal first so that you get an idea as to how things are? Uh, when you plan your subsequent surgery, because nothing prepares you as good as when you actually see them in front, see the bits in front of you. So in the history and examination, again, this is what most of, but specifically in complex total hip replacements, we talk about symptoms and again, pain, instability, and stiffness would be the main issues. Leg length discrepancy will come into it. The past history, whether they've had any problems as a child, whether they had any previous operations, the comorbidity is more or less tend to be irrelevant in that sense, because if they're not fit for an operation, you wouldn't consider doing it. But I try and get from the patient what the expectations from their joint replacement are going to be. Because as you all probably know, there's a lot of emphasis on patient reported outcome measures. So if it is not, you might have done a fantastic hip replacement, but if it doesn't deliver what the patient wants it to deliver, then the operation is not really successful. Um, in terms of the surgical side of things, examination, so looking at the scars, so anterior scars, if they've had osteotomy, if they've had a cocker langenbeck type of approach to try and incorporate that into your operation, um, how, how mobile is the joint? What is the leg length discrepancy? And most importantly, what the abductor function is, which becomes really tricky if the hip is fused. And in those scenarios, what you have to do is try and work out by palpating the abductors and seeing them if they are sort of if you can actually trigger them on. Sometimes MRI scans can give you that information. If there's fatty involvement of the abductors, then you've got not a lot of chance. And then examining other joints, for example, if the knee is fused, doing a complex hip replacement above that is likely to not be that successful. In part of the pre-op workup, then you go on to the additional imaging. And for me, ultrasound rarely in terms of you're looking for sepsis in the joint itself. But in most cases, it is the CT scan, which gives you an idea of the bone stock and an MRI scan. So those tend to be my main go-to areas when I'm trying to plan this out. If there's any suspicion of infection, i.e. especially in the rapid acute destructive arthritis, then aspiration as a first stage is always helpful. State surgery, again, if the hip is completely destroyed and I'm thinking about replacing it, then sometimes I don't worry about the aspiration because you're going to have to go in. In any case, the hip is not salvageable. And in those cases, I think about doing the operation in a staged fashion. Templating, whether you do it manually or on the software is the key to it. So as it is said that sort of surgery is most of planned in this period and then just enacted in theater. That's why it's called a theater. Um, and then the surgical strategies to try and address various specific problems that you would come across in these situations. So MDT is something that we find quite helpful. And again, I know a lot of places do it routinely. So we have our MDT on a Friday morning where all routine cases, pre-op and post-op are discussed. But then there's a spe specific time, maybe sort of 20 minutes, half an hour set aside for the complex cases. So in cases where you kind of think that actually, should I be doing a joint replacement or not? Or does this, is, is my line of thinking, getting sort of validation from your colleagues is always good. And in tricky cases, some pe sometimes you can utilize the combined experience. So as to say that, oh, actually in that scenario, this, I found it quite helpful doing an osteotomy or something like that. So I would strongly encourage, especially if you're embarking on this journey now, then setting up MDT is a good governance measure uh, that's quite useful going forward. 
we have a radiologist joining us. So again, they're helpful in saying that when well, actually I don't think CT scan will give you what you want and ultrasound scan would be better to evaluate the abductor function or something like that. So their input is always valuable. The informed consent, um, you go into the pros and cons of surgery, the non-operative treatment, what would happen if you left them by themselves? And the bailout plan, and that's very specifically in cases of a fused hip, because you're essentially going to try and convert a stable situation into an unstable one. So the patients don't like that. If you set out to convert a fusion or take down fusion to a hip replacement, and for whatever reason it doesn't go to plan or doesn't deliver, and you have to then end up, say, for example, getting infected and you take everything out and leave them with an excision, you've changed a stable situation for them, albeit with stiffness and back pain into an unstable situation. And the patients don't like that, as you would expect. The key thing in the informed consent bit is setting managing expectations. So what you can deliver and what you can't. So the choices to make on the acetabular side are, do I use allograft or do you use autograft? Augments and cup cage constructs can be quite useful. Uh, we used to do a lot of impaction grafting. We don't do it as much now, um, partly because of the augments that are available. Using a jumbo cup. And then the instability options in terms of dual mobility, which is used in a big way, certainly here, and can be quite helpful in sticky situations. And then the constrained options. So again, where the abductors are not functioning or they've got associated neuromuscular problems like cerebral palsy, the constrained option is quite a good one to go for. And then the bantam options. So I deal with a lot of pediatric hips. And in those cases, the smaller cups, which you may, you may not have on the shelf are quite handy to have as otherwise you get suddenly caught out. On the femoral side, there is a usual debate between uncemented and cemented. And I think in most cases, in this sort of situation, the cemented stem can be a lot more versatile because you can allow for sort of abnormalities in version. You need the small stem sizes again with a decent offset. Now, some of the small stems have a weight limitation on it. For example, the Karai size six has a weight limit of 60 or 70 kilos. So if you're planning to use that, you have to realize that the patient's if the pediatric population, they're going to grow older and they're going to put on weight. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, the version options. So Zimmer had come up with a stem which had version options. Um, there was a recall on it, but again, that's something that could help you restore stability and restore the version. And then the Calca reconstruction stems, the sleeve options, and always, if you have to do an osteotomy, have a revision stem on standby. So this is what I would, would be my main go-to options on the acetabular side. So either the bulk allograft, unless I have some autograft available, the augments, and then impaction grafting. On the femoral side, you have the sort of connective Zimmer version, or you have the revision stems and the SROM prosthesis, which is again, a sort of has got a sleeve and it can be quite useful where the femoral anatomy is slightly distorted. So we'll go through a few cases and try and sort of apply those philosophies to the situation. So this is what we would call rapid acute destructive osteoarthritis, which is quite a common primary diagnosis in our case. And as you can see, the cases are fairly recent. Elderly patient further complicated by an extensive spinopelvic fusion. So the concerns in this case that was the lateral x-ray and you would tend to worry about infective pathology. So an infected joint would look exactly like that. So part of my preoperative workup would be inflammatory markers followed by aspiration if necessary and a two-stage procedure. So I would always counsel the patient about a two-stage procedure. In thinking about this, the modalities of acetabular reconstruction, you can think about jumbo cup and impaction bone grafting. My concern in this case was mainly of the spinal fusion leading to instability. Most of the dislocations that we've had have been where the spine is stiff either inherently or because of surgical intervention. And those are the ones where the pelvic pelvis tends to be flexed up and it's very difficult to try and sort of control that because even when sitting, it's, it can cause a significant amount of instability. 
So in a younger patient, in these sort of situations, I would definitely go for impaction bone grafting and a cemented cup. Impaction bone grafting doesn't work quite so well when there is an uncemented cup. So I would always go for a cemented cup with those situations. The concern would be of instability. And if you are using a constrained cup, then a cemented constraint on the back of impaction bone grafting becomes fairly tricky. So in this case, my thought process is after ruling out infection. So she had an aspiration which ruled out any evidence of infection and low demand elderly patients. I just went for a slightly higher hip center with multiple screw options, just in case I have to bail out to a constraint option. As it turns out, we didn't need it and the hip stability was pretty good. And on the femoral side, there were no concerns. So this is what I would call a more of an acetabular problem and not so much of a femoral problem. The main reason it was an issue was we had to restore the leg lengths because of the accepting the higher hip center. In a lot of cases, the higher hip center is deemed to have a higher failure rate. But again, if it's unless it's way up in the acetabulum, I haven't had a problem with it. So a much quicker operation. And it's I'm sorry. Sorry about that. So that's the lateral view and you get a good spread of three screws. So even if you have to then bail out to a constrained option, if she were to keep on dislocating, or if she had a dislocation, then you have another option to go in and just change the line to a constrained one. So accepted a slightly higher hip center, leg lengths were equalized, intraoperative samples were taken and they were negative. And in this particular case, standard bearing surface gave adequate stability, if not, the bailout option would be going to a dual mobility option. Now, you'll realize that in these cases, I'm not talking about the approach because in complex hip replacements, my standard approach would be to go with a posterior approach. Okay, because it's extensile, you can do trochan. I mean, I think again, that's my standard approach for normal hip replacements, so it stands to reason, which is why I don't actually think about an approach. I just go in with the posterior approach and then extend it as necessary release the gluteus maximus if necessary. So a similar case, a rapid acute destructive osteoarthritis subsequent to avascular necrosis in this case. And you can see on the pre-op templating, this is a software that we use for templating. And again, with the templating options, you can see that once you put the cemented cup in there, there's a big gap on the top. So you have all of this, which would be uncovered. So as against the previous case where we talked about just putting a jumbo cup with a slightly higher hip center in a younger patient, I would always want to give them the bone stock back. And the way to do this in the way I choose it would be impaction bone grafting. Now, anything less than a centimeter with impaction bone grafting works pretty well as long as it's done meticulously. This is on the cusp of that, probably a bit higher. So in this instance, and we still had a decent amount of femoral head available. So this is one where we chose to go with a bulk allograft. And fixed with two screws. And then you get adequate cover enough to put a cemented hip in there. So that's the post-op x-ray. And, and the way to do it is we have something called male-female remus. So you can actually denude the bone of all the cartilage, then fix the femoral head in C2 with K wires, put the two screws and then ream into it to get your established reconstruction. You can then shave off the additional bone and then you have your sort of custom implant, if you like, um, ready with the added advantage of giving bone stock back to the patient for subsequent revisions. So similar cases with bilateral avascular necrosis with acetabular erosion. And in this case, because the bone graft is not that massive then, or the bone defect is not that massive, we chose to go with impaction bone grafting. And again, Schroes has described this method very well. You make croutons of the femoral head and then try and wash them, mix it with some sort of iliac crest blood. So that it, it gives some sort of bone morphogenic proteins, and then you impact it, which is a fairly meticulous technique, but one that gives very good results. And 
there are multiple studies on this which shows it to be a lasting option so that your next operation becomes an absolute ease. The only reason I said we don't do impaction drafting as often as we used to is because now we have augments. So in a similar case where I would have, I would have used the mesh, I would not now use a buttress augment um, and then put a shim underneath it, reconstruct it. So that screw that you see on the top is through the buttress. And then you carry on with your cemented cup underneath. And that's a lot quicker. And these are the follow-ups. This is sort of nearly four years down the line now. The other thing I mentioned is the metastatic work. So this was fairly recent, as you see on the 5th of August, uh, that we confronted right total lip replacement done some years ago and then had metastatic prostate cancer. The specific problems that you would encounter in this case is there is a fracture, so you need to do something about it. So the femoral side poses its own problems. But on the acetabular side, what's quite deceptive among all the bony involvement is the amount of lysis there is subsequent to the metastatic tumor. And so cross-sectional imaging would be the preferred method to try and gauge further knowledge about this. So you have the femoral lesions out here, but on the established side, have a look at this. So big defect there, superiorly and directly medially. So any reaming in here, you'll just go through it. Plus this is diseased bone and there's a fraction of femur. So you can't do your standard hemiarthroplasty in it because it will just go through the floor. You can't do your standard cup because it will go through the floor. So in these cases, you need some alternative strategies. And that's where you would go with this gap cage reconstruction. Okay, so in this, it's the CT quantifies the bone loss better. And I would urge you in most cases with complex primary replacements, hip replacements, do get a CT scan. It gives you a better idea of what bone stock you have available. And then cement is useful to achieve that federal concrete construct. So what you would do is cure it out the metastatic lesions, send it off for histopathology, then put cement in it, and then put this cup that has the flanges in. So it sits like a hammock. This goes under the quadrilateral plate inside and then curves around the, the sort of through the obturator foramen. So you have to take the transverse ligament off to place this inside. And then these screws are in. As soon as you get the mold the flanges, you put cement in and put the screws through the cement, which get, gives you a fantastic hold. And then you can cement in a standard acetabular cup inside. On the femoral side, we chose to bypass it by a long cemented stem. And as I'm sure Prof Crawford mentioned about the Exeter, um, in fact, there's a very recent study that came out of um, Bristol actually, that the Exeter stem is so good that irrespective of what unit is, does it and surgical expertise, it delivers the results. So cemented stems by and far do the job for me. In this case, the other option is to use a cup cage construct. My reluctance with the cup cage construct or indeed a, a custom made implant is that A, it's expensive, but B, because the bone is diseased, there is no way you're going to get a good biological ingrowth. So that's why I rely on cement. A custom acetabulum is another option. So that would be another option on the acetabular side. So you can get the companies to get a CT model done. And then the cup has these three flanges which sit on it. And you get really good fixation with this big screw um, going into the decent bone stock. Nowadays, short of this, you can have a cone acetabulum which then the cone goes into there and goes along the sacroiliac joint. So that can again give you a good sort of bailout if you have that sort of facility. Moving on to some other conditions. So pediatric hips, old slipped upper femoral epiphysis. You can see the growth plates are still open, but this is slipped. So we waited for the trochanteric apophysis to fuse and see if he could cope but you can now start to see that he's starting to erode into the acetabulum. So what was initially just a femoral problem has now turned into an acetabular problem as well. And that's where we are about four or five months down the line. 
Okay, so now it's started to create its own shelf here, which is the point that we thought we would intervene and the apophysis is almost disappeared. And in the pediatric conditions with the smaller implants, I do tend to go with the SROM prosthesis. That would be my go-to prosthesis. Again, a posterior approach, big releases, but it can accommodate for the change in version. So you can place your sleeve independently and adjust your version of the stem inside it. So the challenges in this case were the shortening. He had had previous surgery with the screw fixation and which was taken out subsequently. So infection was always into the mix. The small component size, altered anatomy, instability and abductive dysfunction. So we reconstructed with the SROM prosthesis. Again, I tend to go with screw options, even though it's a pediatric population and we went with ceramic on plastic bearings. So you can see that in this case, you can put the sleeve independent and then change the version of the stem as to your needs to then assure stability. We talk about a bit about the combined problems. So this is very early on when so if you're young, you want to take on everything. And then you, over the years, you mature and you grow a bit wiser. So this was a chap who had had a fusion in his teens and then significant leg length discrepancy. He was not happy with it, starting to get back pain and talked me into doing a joint replacement. Um, got a, did this as a stage procedure. So took all the metal work out, sent samples. And I thought I'd do it, everything by the book. Did that, got a CT scan and then went on to a hip replacement without image intensifier. And I would urge you again, if you're thinking about doing this, always go for an image intensifier intraoperatively because once you go in there, you just have a big mass of fused bone and it's very difficult to work out where you start. So the challenges in this case particularly are the first thing is the need for surgery. So back pain was a sort of a realistic problem in this case expectations, what they get, instability was an issue, single or two stage procedure, the anatomy tends to be altered and the, whether the sciatic nerve will lend itself to you sort of stretching the leg down. And then methods for removal of existing metalwork because sometimes the head of the screw shears off and then you're stuck. So having carbide drills is quite handy to break out existing metalwork. Again, went for a high hip center. Now this sort of a high hip center, I would not accept now, but I can only assume that my osteotomy was slightly higher. As it so happens, the hip survived, but wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing picture. So long stem on the femoral side, um, abductor function wasn't great, but we managed to go with the standard implants. But this sort of thing, I would definitely try and bring the hip center down now. And just to give you a, a sort of a sense of what I would do now sort of or subsequently in other cases is we'll talk a bit about the cross-sectional imaging but image intensifier I would always use the image intensifier if I'm going back in because when you go in a the approach is difficult you have to do the osteotomy early on otherwise the hip is not mobile but there's just a big sheet of bone that you get confronted with and it's very difficult to make sense of where to do your osteotomy the traditional teaching is you do an osteotomy higher up and then re revise it when you're absolutely sure. But in doing that, if you've not got it in the absolutely the right place, you can suffer. This is what I would do subsequently. So this is another gentleman who had the hip fused, but on this occasion, I resisted taking the metalwork out because that actually gives you a natural plane for the osteotomy. So you just on the pre-op plan, you decide that you're going to do an osteotomy just above that screw and you would be in the right ballpark. So at this, you take the screw out, take the metal work out, mark this and do the osteotomy because that can be your guide to getting you to the teardrop. So that's what I would change. And surprise, certainly you are in the right place. Okay. So those are things that you kind of learn along the way. Um, on the side is the two year lateral x-ray and it's still functioning very well. We missed that one screw at the top. Uh, but we really couldn't find it. And then you have the femoral de deformity. So this is a young lad, he's 19, who had a septic arthritis of his hip when he was very young. So Tom Smith's type of arthritis. 
then had a pelvic supportive osteotomy done with Ilizarov, which meant that you had the snake-like deformity of the femur, but his leg lengths were absolutely spot on. Okay. And this is where I've mentioned the MDT, which can come in handy. So the lengths were equal, the femur was curved, abductors were pretty much non-existent. Um, he was very young, so he's 19, so he's going to have multiple operations in his lifetime. Instability would have been an issue. Sorry. Instability would have been an issue. Can you still hear me? Um, and then soft issues. So this was one case where the MDT, the discussions around in our unit were that we should not do anything for this. So I had to actually send this patient across to another unit to get their opinion. And then we did this. So we pretty much resected the bone, kept the abductors or whatever were left of it on the trochanter and put a revision stem in. Okay, so modular revision stem. And the thought process behind that was that these stems, so certainly some of the revision stems are recommended use. They don't need proximal support on that basis. So your other go-to thing in this case would have been a proximal femoral replacement. There's no way you could bring the hip down, resect it and accept that. So we had to sacrifice that bone. That meant we got over the bow a bit, just enough to get a straight stem in. The stabler bit was not that challenging, really, once you've got the femur out of the way. So on the lateral side, again, a decent fit. Okay. Sort of attach the abductors. And you can see that the leg lengths are pretty spot on. Okay. So be careful with your resections. Seek approval for these sort of reconstructions. And then mid-shaft femoral fractures. Again, this is where templating comes in quite handy. So on the right side, looking at the hip replacement on the right, although it's a revision stem, you kind of think you might encounter a problem with this bow. Thankfully, the deformity in the size plane is not that bad, but templating shows you that you would end up just above the deformity, okay? So we decided to go with standard implants and you can see we ended up well short of the deformity and got away with a sort of more conventional hip replacement, which should give them a decent function. Again, the lateral side was not an issue. Last but not least, previous DDH can be pretty challenging. Um, so this, again, was a case very early on. Right side was done for DDH. The left side was a problem. And early on, you kind of think, well, actually, it's quite challenging and we need to have strategies to try and address that. But here we go, eight years down the line, the only change from the previous X-ray is screws on the right side, which is where I've revised the right side, which was the symptomatic side. The left side is completely asymptomatic. It was an incidental finding. So this is where I go back to thinking, having a history and examination, working out which is the actual symptomatic side. If as challenging as the left side would be, She's in a stable situation, you can only make it worse. So always think about your operation and make sure that the patient wants it and is happy with the implications. So this patient has now had a revision of their right hip, but they're still happy with the left. And you saw the x-rays eight years apart where things have not deteriorated significantly because it's got no movement. My take home messages are detailed history and examination, additional investigations, in most cases, a CT scan, meticulous preoperative planning, and then setting realistic expectations. Adequate surgical exposure, which will include a posterior approach in my hands. And then think about your components and do not be afraid to get a custom implant if necessary. If you're struggling, phone a friend because that just gives you support in the lead up to these tricky cases. And always, always think about your next operation. There would be the temptation to try and correct the deformity and address it but always think about your next operation because you never know when you're going to need that bone stop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanchit, for your uh, excellent talk on uh, difficult and challenging situations. And while my uh, you know, elite uh, panelists uh, get ready, uh, just want to uh, sort of uh, discuss a few points. Uh, you know, especially, I think the important take-home messages are you know, to have a proper 
a multi uh, disciplinary meeting so that you really discuss it out and uh, yeah. you know cover all the things that's very very important and um, your informed consent do you actually write down uh, you know per patient or is it a printed form so you have the the hospital consent form but we write individual things uh, and then you dictate it as well so okay. you would mention additional procedures in that process so if you are talking about a stage procedure you would mention that specifically yeah because you know you uh, were very good in clarifying all the points to cover in a informed consent because a printed form will never have all these things no and especially in your situation or in even in any situation i think it's important to write this down uh, you know like you know with titles for example yeah. you know bail out what will happen yeah. you know if if i cannot do this what will happen and so on and uh, coming to your cases uh, the first one you showed what was the cup size and why was the reason to go for a higher hip center i mean chasing the bone uh, because you could have uh, you know gone where you wanted to uh, with that yeah yeah so i could have easily brought it down i said yeah. she's the only reason to go for a high hip center was this lady was in her 80s low demand okay and had presented and my main concern in that case was the spinal in sort of fusion yes so most of our problems have occurred and there's a lot of work done on spinal pelvic alignment now as i'm sure yes you, uh, we discussed and it. and and the issue is that you try and do a big reconstruction the stress is if you have to go into a constrained situation at that point the stresses on the bone cement or whichever interface you have are considerable so in those cases i tend to go with a more of a jumbo implant and if the walls don't allow me i would accept a slightly higher hip center even now so you you just chase the bone in that situation in that particular case yeah and and another question is that you know in that very uh, deformed snake like femur uh, you use a revision stem uh you know were you uh, which stem was that and were you worried about the distal you know sort of natural bow of the femur which was there i mean you got a three point fixation in the end but yeah uh, you know what was that stem and uh, you know could you template that before you decided on using it yeah so it was the arco stem which is a biomed zimmer one okay um and the reason for like i said the options there would have been a proximal femoral replacement or a cemented stem mm -hmm. so a cemented stem at this point in time is not sort of for unsupported use it you cannot use that with uh, with either the restoration or the arcos they are meant to use without any proximal or not meant to be used they can be used without any proximal bone support so the alternative was to go a proximal femoral replacement now if i run into problems with that bow lower down i'm going to just resect the additional bone and put a proximal femur in it so that's my bailout option which is what i meant by having your next operation thought of so worst case scenario if this fails i just resect additional bone and put a proximal femoral replacement in yeah and last so, point is you know to have a very low threshold for having intraop imaging i think even in in primary yeah. situations if it's very thick medial osteophyte or infused hips i think and in difficult primaries it's very very important to you know cater for that and book your image intensifier so i think i'm sure my panelists have their points or uh, comments ready so gurinder i can see you uh, itching to ask a question or make a comment how are you doing boss so we we used to be co-regions class together so i think we we do have uh, almost similar mentors at one time tell me sachin i mean you know we both uh, work with people who've been sort of passionate about their approaches for for difficult hips and all do you think uh, the hip surgeon should have the versatility to switch between approaches in difficult cases or do you feel in difficult cases stick with what you know better and go with that so i think the latter because those are you you need to be versatile because there are times when like we were discussing that we've been core registrars so especially with some of the approaches the omega approach for example if the abductors have not healed in the revision scenario you are almost obliged to go through the same area and the old teaching about if you're changing just one component stick to the approach that was previous so i think you do need to be versatile in your approach but i think in those tricky cases i would always go with the all sort of op approach that i'm comfortable with we have all have strategies to try and sort of expand that approach so because my default is a post to approach i don't even think about it it gives lets me carry on the femur as much as i need to it 
allows me to extend up the acetabulum, especially when you want to get your flanges in, which do go a long way. So I think that's my only reason to go with the posterior approach. Then I don't have to think about it. In those operations, you have plenty of other things to think about without having to spend much more time on the approach. What do you do, um, Sachin, your, uh, your, your, your go-to parameters for bringing your hip down as regards the sciatic nerve in terms of... Uh, the Americans love the idea of uh, nerve monitoring and everything when they when when they start bringing the hips, the hips down. Would you rather sort of just keep keep a hand on the nerve and keep feeling the tautness, or yeah. or is everybody shifting now to a safer version and and putting nerve monitoring? No, unfortunately, we are not into nerve monitoring yet. Uh, I th I can see Nikhil joined us. Vikas there, Narinder. Yeah. Uh, Surinder, any any points questions? Dr. Mandale, it was an excellent demonstration of uh, handling difficult hips and uh, we really enjoyed your talk. A few things I want to just on the same case, which uh, Dr. Kiran had pointed out that you use a uh, ARCOS uh, modular stem. Uh, why did you, uh, your choice for the distal profile of the stem, it was a cylindrical, possibly full coat stem for a distal fixation. You yeah. also had the option of a splined conical stem in that, in the ARCOS. So any particular reason you selected this because a uh, uh, splined stem, which is conical in design, a tapering stem, sometimes is supposed to have a better result. And uh, what any particular, or you just used it because it was there. So I think the thought process, the ARCOS is a fairly versatile stem. So my thought process behind that was if I had to resect a bit more bone, Mm -hmm. And I was going into, if you see the canal lower down, it widens quite significantly. Can you just go back to the slide if you can, if it's uh, easily accessible? Yeah, the, uh, the bow was on the tip, I think. Yeah. So my concern in this case was that if I ended up with a resection further lower down and I had to go into this territory, even if with, with a corrective osteotomy, my concern was that I might not get the a sort of a press fit here, in yeah. which case the ARCOS would give me the option of a distal locking. Um, not necessarily to be utilized, but then the ARCOS gives me that ability to lock it distally if I'm struggling. Yeah, but in the ARCOS stem, the distal... Uh, portion has got three varieties. One is like bullet, this one full coat. There is one splined, which is uh, conical. And that, that also has a locking option when it is... The, again, that I, I didn't sort of... We okay. were just beginning to use the ARCOS stem at the yeah. time. Okay. And that was the because, one that we had. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I come in there? Yes, On behalf please. of Sanchit? Yeah. So obviously, I don't know the details of Sanchit's case, but we have all the three ARCOSs and I've used all the, all the various designs. If you want to use the cone conical version, you really need to have a very, very good isthmus with good quality bone in it. Now, this is almost like an S-shaped femur. So I don't think even I would be very confident that the cone conical version will work well. Whereas the, the cylindrical version of the bullet tip is exactly like the copy of the solution stem. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. full cord solution. And that needs about five to seven centimeters of solid scratch fit in the femur. And then after that, it ingrows and basically it does not come out. If you have to take that out, you have to take the femur out. Yeah. But uh, there is another way to solve this. And I keep going back on my old fashioned way. Uh, I've got a couple of cases like this where we have made a 3D model of the femur and then done um, a mock hip replacement on the lab workshop. I'll show the pictures next time. And... Um, when we did the lab workshop, we realized that there were small cemented stems, uh, like the Asian version of C stems, which are shorter and thinner yeah. and smaller than the Exeter small stems. And they, they fit very nicely. So uh, I was able to get away without having to sacrifice the femur, which is a very good strategy in a difficult case. But we were able to get away effectively with a small um, cemented stem. Yeah. So there's uh, there's many, many ways to skin a cat. These are extremely challenging cases. And yeah. having had a 3D printer now on, on site has really helped us to 
plan these cases better very very yeah, nice case sanjit very well done done very beautifully and uh, yeah. the problem which sanjit mentioned is the the patient wait you know so uh, you know using such uh, you know small uh, custom or uh, very delicate stems uh, you know there may be a risk if the patient puts on weight later on uh, of uh, there's um, there's no weight limit for the cemented sti stem so we have used it for about 15 16 years and i think we are just about to report a series of 130 cases that's excellent okay. yeah majority of these small patients are not that heavy even when they do grow the cemented stems can cope with them Dr. Sanchit, uh, coming to the choice of cups, and uh, you have flexibly used almost all types, cemented to uncemented, and the liners. I wanted to just have your thought on this. That I, I, I saw you using constrained options a number of times. Uh, maybe, of course, the case demanded. That's why you decided. But between constraint and dual mobility, like uh, what our thought is generally that if we have an abductor which is there but not exactly deficient we go for uh, dual mobility it is only when the abductor is totally defunct or lost that we think about constraint in an elderly uh, here you have gone to constraint even in a younger patient maybe there was complete loss of abductor i don't know so i your thoughts on the choice of dual mobility versus uh, constraint uh, i agree i think i would go for dual mobility over constraint every single time if i could Okay. Um, this particular patient, so this is the one that we are talking about. Yes. Um, so this was the one that we used the constrained hip, and this was okay. because the patient had. No. Okay. So I had to go through the legal team because this patient had uh, learning difficulties. So his consenting was fairly tricky. His carers insisted that he was in pain every time they tried to move him, and so on and so forth. We have had multiple conversations with him, and he was. unreliable in terms of so i didn't want to do a take down and then end up with a dislocation uh, this is where i went back to this discussion about expectations so he had mild learning difficulties but we had to get the legal team and get the consent and all those sort of things sorted speak to him through what we call here the imca the sort of independent mediation uh, sort of mental capacity advocates and try and get so i didn't want to take any chances so despite him being young I went for the constraint option straight away, but yeah, yeah, I, would, I think, uh, I think under normal situations I would go dual mobility. Okay, right. No, that was a good uh, good strategy, Sanjit. We have uh, a similar problem like you with the uh, learning dis- uh, disability patients, and like you, we have the legal team. We have something called the adult safeguarding team, and then we invite all the stakeholders, which usually is someone who has his power of attorney. We sit across table to table, usually five to ten people with the legal team there. we discuss everything and only then after that three four meetings only then we agree to do these operations yeah this is one because- i had to spend a lot of time purely because like i said he was in a stable situation yes he had pain and they were struggling to get him in a, in his chair and so on and so forth but yeah he was in a stable situation and it uh, was uh, can you go back on the slide so you said that uh, you did uh, keep the metal one uh, implant in t- because that gave you a guide to you know level make level. your cut so that you could yeah. come into the acetabulum so can you just uh, expand a bit on that please so essentially in your lateral position when you're coming up to you you've got your seven screw yeah is where if i go in here my inferior i could get to the tear drop okay so that was my logic so you sort of you take the seven screw out um, you put a mark there on the side And, and that's then, where you would do your osteotomy, and okay. then you can revise that by t- resecting more bone. But you could also you have the additional bone to ream into, um, and similarly, then you can take a bit more off on the femoral side, lower down, and revise your cut. But at least it lets you in and mobilizes the hip in the right place. Yeah, that's a that's a good strategy. Um, uh, Narinder uh, or anybody else, any more points to discuss with Sanjit? Just just that now. one interesting stem he showed to us the ml taper corrective mm-hmm. which has been withdrawn which should be drawn yeah yeah so uh, basically just wanted to highlight that a lot of fractures have been reported at the model yes. just in yeah. that that's why it, it was withdrawn and those just are cases couple, where i would use a cemented stem so that you can accommodate for the version but the srom gets you out of that yeah probably as srom is a very good substitute for that all, all those cases yeah there are, 
just two more small questions i've had one i wanted to ask uh, you have been using uh, graphs the autograft or allograft i think you used the allograft uh, yeah. here so what is your line of thought regarding uh, impacting small sizes to a bulk to an augment so it will be decided on the amount of defect and if you have to do a impaction when will you like to protect the impaction with the cage or something if the impaction uh, the the amount of grafting is more or you would go to a bulk or go to an augment so uh, keeping in mind that you are now shifting almost to augment was it for a particular mm -hmm. reason or uh, so what's your so the reason so as gurinder would know we have a long history of using bulk allografts and impaction bone grafting both techniques were the ones our mainstay so where it's an uncontained defect i would go with a bulk allograft if i can i wouldn't use a bulk allograft sort of i'll revise that i would use a bulk autograft so if the femoral head is there and any to any significant degree i would use the autograft and then we had one of the papers which suggested slightly higher failure rates at 7 years to 8 years that's when the impaction grafting was coming in so then if i can't if i don't have enough of a femoral head available that i can use the same autograft to bolt it back on i would use impaction bone grafting and use a mesh with it so if it's an uncontained defect i would almost certainly use autograft then cut it into big croutons mix it with autologous blood and then impact it and then put a cemented cup in bulk, bulk allografts are out i mean they will fail it but for surprising they end up failing at about 5 to 7 years is what what bill harris showed in his paper um, I, sanjay that sanjay actually wrote his thesis on on the uh, on the kind of grafting didn't you sanjay that thing you looked at the size of the grafts you looked at the long term in yeah. both the femur and the uh, stabular side if i remember correct yeah So an impact can I grafting... make a comment on that? I'm yes, sure, Nikhil. Of course. Can I make a comment on the graft? Yes, please. So, Gurinder, um, I respectfully disagree. I don't think bulk allografts are out at all in um, in revision surgery and in pelvic and osteoarthritis surgery. This is better now. I think I'm on my main PC. I, I can't handle one Nikhil, and I'm getting two Nikhils out here. Is that better? Yeah, that's, that's better. Fine. No echo now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yeah, can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I've been using bulk allograft in revisions for almost fifteen to sixteen years. Um, obviously, bulk autografts are always better. And my philosophy is, if the patient is young, where you expect another revision, I would prefer to use a bulk allograft for an uncontained defect. if the patient is elderly or older usually above 60 65 then i would go straight to an augment yeah. and uh, if the defect is a combined defect so you have a cavitary defect and an uncontained segmental loss that segment may be posterior superior anterior inferior or even central then i would go for combined reconstruction so the bulk allograft converts an uncontained defect into a contained defect by replacing the rim and the impaction grafting replaces the volume but i've used it for almost 15 years and i can show you data of up to 10 12 years of allograft i've used it underneath a pelvic and acetabular plate as well when i reconstruct pelvic discontinuities so when the entire posterior acetabulum is missing and hand on heart i haven't had a failure that i could blame on the bulk allograft so the reasons they fail usually is um, the the technique is very 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 important mm. If your if your bulk allograft is loaded predominantly in compression superiorly, then the two screws that Sanjit um, showed is excellent. If it is posterior or posterior superior, so sort of at eleven o'clock, ten o'clock, nine o'clock, or the whole posterior column is missing, then you have to uh, support the bulk allograft with a posterior column plate. And I'll show you some intraoperative photographs and X-rays when when we do our revision surgery. But they do work. I know they have a bad name based on Bill Harris's work. and again I, i the less i comment on dr harris's papers the better but we have good data on that yeah and we still but, use the bulk autograft from time to time the simple yeah. reason why we moved away to augments is our bone bank got taken away from us yeah so, and we we have a bone bank on site so we have so, literally an unlimited supply of bone graft so now we augments would be our default choice yeah, yeah. just that was the main decider Correct. We were we were paying seven hundred and fifty pounds for a femoral head allograft, 
now because we have it on site it costs us 15 pounds so you yeah. look at the difference well that Just, that is uh, really uh, economic sense you know if you have it on site but in india it's very difficult to have uh, bone banks and uh, to get graft that is a big problem with us uh, and uh, i think one uh, last sorry. comment i would like to make on sanchez stock is the cementation has been immaculate in all your slides you know it's complete white out and it's it's really fantastic cement so which stems do you prefer in your cemented uh, armamentarium um, so which stems I'm, would you use i think i use between the exeter and um, the c stem i think i have slightly i love the exeter stem uh, i like the c stem but i'm more a fan of a, of the pinnacle cup so that's when i sort of choose between the exeter so all my cemented complete cemented hips get an exeter stem with a contemporary or sort of og cup uh, and then my hybrids get a c stem so in your young you. patients you have not been uh, using the cemented uh, stem so any particular reason because you can control your version even with the cemented stem you have been using esrom in your uh, so no specific reason apart from the sometimes it's a lot easier to reconstruct it um with uh, uncemented prosthesis and then the sort of offset options are still decent um again it is a more of a sort of kit and the way we have set up is our we do all our elective surgery in one center the kids hospital is another place so if you have sort of that additional thing about cement mixing and things like that i can't guarantee that side of things so i try and keep it simple because i have to get the kit in for the kids hospital i try and get one system that i know is going to cover all bases so, but you don't mind using a cemented stem in a 18 year old or a 16 year old no i wouldn't yeah because again the revision is so straightforward that it yeah. they they are very predictable excellent i think it's time to go for the cases because we've got a lot of interesting cases and uh, let us uh, welcome uh, the first speaker who's ready with your case uh dr vishal rajput you are first so let's start with your case so i think uh, we are seeing the entire spectrum here from the difficult and to you know simple but uh, challenging cases so i think no case is simple and we can learn a lot from each case so uh, dr vishal rajput are you ready yes yes i am ready i'm just sharing the slide now just so the format we have yeah. suggested is just uh, four slides and uh, so that we can have enough time for discussion so dr vishal rajput first case yeah thank you very much that was an excellent presentation by the previous speaker dr mantle and i'll be presenting a case which will be nowhere close to the complexity of the case presented earlier uh so i'd like to declare there is no conflict of interest patient demographics there was a 71 year old lady complaining of bilateral hip pain from past 4 years which was affecting her day and day to day activities right hip was worse than the left her walking distance was limited to a few hundred yards medical comorbidities included type 2 diabetes hypertension uh her bmi was 37 at that at that time uh clinical findings were she had an antalgic gait walking with a stick extremely restricted range of movement of her hip uh flexion was about 80 internal rotation was nil external rotation of 10 ad adduction and abduction both were limited uh to 5 to 5 and 10 degrees respectively uh she had no limb length discrepancy uh pre op blood tests and other investigations were normal apart from uh slightly reduced hemoglobin of 109 and this is her pre op x ray which shows uh, quite severe osteoarthritis affecting both her hips i would say both were almost end stage uh, arthritis with right slightly worse than the left so challenges i would say <coughs> quite severe uh, stage of arthritis stiff hip uh, low hp 
uh, and slightly higher BMI. Intraoperatively, I would be uh, uh, worried about dislocating the hip and would be ready with uh, need of in situ neck resection if necessary. I did some manual templating. Uh, there was no limb line discrepancy. Identified the teardrop as well as the roof of the stabilum and uh, identified the center of rotation uh, as well as the femoral offset. My plan was to do a posterior approach, uh, meticulous dissection to have adequate exposure. Uh, Preoperatively, of course, uh, all our patients have tranexamic acid uh, unless uh, contraindicated. I plan to do an uncemented total hip. Processes in this case, uh, my uh, our process of choice was a coral pinnacle a combination and before that, I would, I would I made sure that all the sizes and uh, offsets are available, as well as screws kept ready for estabulum. Articulation, I was planning to do a metal on polyethylene and a head size. Uh, uh, I had uh, kept all that size ready, but I was more keen on using a 32 articulates uh, head. A rational being uh, doing an uncemented in this case was uh, the long-term survivorship of the coral pinnacle uh, system, which shows about 96% survival at the end of 13 years. It's a post-op x-ray. Uh, procedure was uh, uneventful. We could achieve uh, good fixation and there was no need of screws for a stabulum on the stabular side. Uh, reasonably uh, uh, acceptable post-operative x-ray. Uh, she was quite pleased with the surgery and uh, started full weight bearing from day one. Uh, commenting on post-operative x-ray, I would say it could have been uh, on the vestibular side, could have been uh, medialized a bit more. Uh, and uh, apart from that, I got the, I got the x-ray uh, today, in fact, from my previous hospital and she's four years post-op. So, uh, and one of my colleagues has replaced the other side doing exactly uh, opposite of what I did, but uh, successful uh, hip bilateral hip replacement, I would say. So, Excellent. I uh, appreciate thanks, uh, all the comments. Thanks for this case, uh, uh, Vishal. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, while my uh, panelists, uh, you know, get ready with their comments and, and questions, I mean, a few uh, things I would like to ask uh, all the faculty is, you know, what are your thoughts on a bilateral single sitting uh, hip replacements? And what is the rationale for uh, using a collar in a, in a tapered, you know, fully coated, uh, you know, successful design like the Korai? And, uh, you know, the neck cut is, is quite, uh, you know, low, right above the uh, sort of lesser trochanter. So any reason, uh, particular reason for that? No. Yeah, this one, if you look at the preoperative x-ray, there was a short neck. So I was afraid if I had cut it a bit longer. I appreciate it is slightly on uh, uh, close to lesser trochanter. And ideally with the coral stem, you should have about an, uh, one finger breadth about the lesser trochanter. But uh, in this case, I, uh, I, I, I uh, purposefully made the cut slightly lower so as to, you know, not to lengthen the uh, leg. Was it your, was and it your templated cut? Uh, like uh, your restoration no, of no. the offsets which you had planned was allowing that much cut. Uh, what I mean to say is that it was all manual templating. There was no what? software uh, templating. No, but done, so okay. So had you planned some kind of a vertical and medial offset preoperatively, or you just went yeah, in, in this by case? The I was expecting us. Yeah, in this case, I was expecting to do slightly lower cut. Mm -hmm. So yeah. do you think uh, you could? Restore the offsets on table, and it was stable. Yeah, of course. Yes. Okay. So I mean, you obviously I, made the cemented guys happy. Uh, I mean, because on the other side, there's a nicely done. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a surprise to me because I just got this X-ray today, and uh, uh, I think the rational being the trust I where I was working, they had a cutoff of seventy-five years, and I, when that did the surgery, she was seven, almost getting to seventy-two. So I could get away by using uncemented implants. So, and 
and now she must be 75 76 rather and i think she had a recent surgery on the on the, on the left side sir so. well and technically the... both have been done very well the cementation you is excellent in. on 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 yeah. the uh, other side and you. Uh, you know i think gurinder mentioned the point to professor ross crawford about the lateral cement in the greater trochanter area i think mm-hmm. i think the key is like when you are you know when you have packed it and when you are inserting the the stem the tendency is to go from the the lateral side and that's when the cement is 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 extruded so i think like professor said you know start at the center and then tilt the stem uh, you know going in so that it you know pushes the cement back and you can get this uh, beautiful mantle uh, all the way around so sanchit uh, you know any particular uh, you know tips and tricks to share in that Sanchit, Sanchit, you Sanchit, you Sanchit, you unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. I think I agree. Uh, apart from the, the philosophical differences between cemented and uncemented, it's it's a well done primary, and that's what counts at the end of the day. Uh, both implants have fantastic survivorship. I agree that the Exeter guys. I don't know if Rob Crawford talk about it, but they switch the introducer to about ninety degrees. So with the Exeter introducer, when you're trying to lean over and push the stem. out into the lateral cortex uh, sometimes the introducer actually hinges on the abductors and the trochanteric area so they mount the stem so that the introducer is at 90 degrees rather than the conventional one so that it allows you to push it further down and stops the stem going into varus so that's quite a handy thing that the extra guys do um, and you can easily if you dismantle the extra introducer it will allow you to switch by 90 degrees yes i think that's important otherwise you you won't get that mantle which you deserve yeah. any other points sir uh, uh, you said that you uh, would have liked to medialize more i think it's adequately medialized i think yeah and yeah, uh, looking at uh, the x ray which was which the, i had the immediate post op x ray so i was thinking of here, you know slightly a millimeter or so uh, i would almost like to touch the iliovestibular line so and would not you always like to, it. to do that or, or maybe this uh, is a literally uh, and here so i would like was, to see uh, on that i would like to obviously leave a lot of bone there because young patients i would leave the bone stocks in case they do they do need a revision surgery uh the other thing which i was thinking this cup should have been slightly more medialized is that uh if you look at the pre op x ray sorry so i was thinking I, maybe i, I left a bit of osteophyte there so, uh, so just about the reaming and preparation of this eccentrically worn a uh, cup i would like the panels input if you go to your pre op uh, yeah. vishal yeah so if you see that uh, this this head is lateralized there is medial bone which you have very well tackled by going uh, right medial because there is a chance that you could have left the cup lateral it's not then mm-hmm. so you have removed the osteophytes well now my point is that in such a eccentric kind of a cup where we want to get it at the right spot there could be times that Uh, there would be a, a air ball here and your cup uh, so in your case you have covered the whole thing and maybe your ap size allowed you that so there are mm-hmm. chances where the ap size would may not allow you to cover the whole thing so eccentric to make it concentric you may have to lose the ap bone so to what extent you would like that and will you uh, think of uh, all this while you are preparing the cup so Uh, the the panels thought on it that your ap size determining whether you would need something on top or you would go bigger size and avoid a defect on the top in an eccentrically worn cup I kiran you are muted, muted uh... kiran you need to unmute yeah yeah okay the, i think the key here is that vishal uh, tackled the medial osteophyte very well and once you you know identify that and then you ream from there subsequently uh, you can you can get away with it and here you know the defect wouldn't have been too much so i think that the key here is to tackle the medial osteophyte uh, the fovea and start reaming and expanding the cup from there sanchit yes. uh, i think that's right kiran i think this, this actually i mean don't remove all the osteophytes on the periphery in the beginning yeah i would not worry too much about yeah. those go, yeah. go 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 with your reaming keep in your cup your trial will give you a very good idea yeah. what and part of the can, cup, cup uh, is uncovered out. and you you can work around this but i mean obviously i think if i were to make a compromise 
I wouldn't like an anterior overhang. That's the one which really gives you a trouble. Even even with the anti added antiversion and the anterior overhang gives you a lot more trouble than the superior overhang, which normally you'll get away with. What is your opinion on the collar, uh, Sanchit and Nikhil? You know. So I think the collar goes against all. Exactly. I mean, I just cannot understand this. So let's. You can't get the feel. The the logic is, the corail was touted by the French Mm -hmm. as an amazing stem, which never fails. Mm -hmm. The registry data and in the hands of the non-altro group, which was the original group that developed the corail, unfortunately, it wasn't. such a fantastic stem they began to find a lot of subsidence and debonding where the buffy coat comes off uh, they blamed it on poor surgical technique because they said in our hands it works and in your hands it doesn't work so the rest of you are not as good as we are uh, subsidence was a problem and in type a femur if i'm honest with you i only understood there was a type a femur a few years ago when the registrar told me that because with cemented stems a femur is a femur you know you prepare it and you put a cemented stem and then you forget for 30 40 years so in type a femurs the problem was uh, the corail stem undergoes a distal potting and proximal toggling as a result of that there was a higher incidence of failure so basically what the french came up is that all corail users now should use a collared corail stem rather than an uncollared corail stem and you should machine the neck in such a way that the collar completely sits on the neck now go and back and have a look at the last 100 xs of corals that you have done and then find out in how many cases your neck is exactly where the collar is in majority of the cases after the first one or two years you will get resorption of bone and it's inevitable that. because i all the corals i have done yeah. are un- uncollared ones even in the uk and in india but yeah. uh, you are right that there is going to be you know such Uh, so the best way i think to deal with that is to well no, switch to cement this is i think uh, uh, to a debate between cemented and uncemented i i love the coral they are very easy to take out we've looked at 130 coral no, stems and only six needed an eto no okay. but we have had a different uh, take on this removing coral becomes difficult because the grooved coated a uh, distal part really gives a problem in trying to take out it integrates distally as you pointed out there are yeah. we have had broken corail with uh, no proximal resorption distal stem which is absolutely integrated and to remove that has been difficult shattering so the smith, so the, smith that, that you that is a, a topic for different uh, times yeah. let's go to the next uh, speaker uh, i think dr dhariwal was next uh, he was the one of the first to Thank join you. so dr dhariwal please you did mute you did you need to unmute yourself yeah, yeah. i just uh, share my screen so yeah. dr dhariwal works in uh, inantar hospital in pune and is a joint replacement surgeon and a good friend and a colleague so uh, yeah. welcome so, yeah. dr dhariwal uh, i just go ahead with my presentation yes, so uh, so my patient uh, was is a 55 year old male with a road traffic accident suffered an intracapsular neck of femur was done a dhs was done elsewhere patient was reasonably all right after the dhs some complaints some pain some limb but managing for some reason the surgeon did an implant removal after one year probably because the patient was complaining or uh, i'm not really clear why he removed the implant but after the implant removal the patient deteriorated very quickly and then he came to me at about 3 months post implant removal so on examination he had a lot of shortening he could not walk without a stick uh, the range was uh, painful and restricted but the scar had healed well there was no local swelling warmth or redness and the markers were all normal so this is the x ray so this is what he came with now uh so i I'll, i'll just take you through the steps uh so i like the input of all uh, our esteemed colleagues about so when we see a patient with previous surgery you know uh, for the for the younger surgeon what what they should be worried about 
yeah you just go ahead with your talk uh, qd and then we will uh, so my worry was uh, when when uh, whenever there i see a uh, patient already been operated then i am i am worried about infection uh, a and i am worried about scar now in this case of course it was a dhs so the hip had not been uh, operated upon so the, the but if the hip has been operated upon then then you have to think about uh, dissection and you have to think about releases and things like that so infection uh, in pre operative markers and also whether uh, you know these these guys have uh, more risk of post op infection on, at the third and fourth surgery so whether there is any role of stimulant uh, even if there is no infection uh, the choice of implant is another thing uh, uh, of course uh, if in the x ray the joint space is has been preserved so uh, you know bipolar is a very liked uh, surgery in india and i am sure a lot of surgeons would look at that x ray and look at that joint space and start thinking about a, a bipolar so uh, of course i would not do a bipolar but uh, again i would like the the seniors to reinforce that and um, then uh, whether we should do a cemented or an uncemented uh, the the stem side uh, were, the bone is uh, already got a implant there are screws and this patient has been uh, operated one year post op they not been walking well so quality of the bone is suspect so yes yeah, cemented would be a better option for the stem and the intra op challenge is the thing that uh, worried me was the screws whether uh, how to manage that and uh, whether those screws were uh, uh enough uh, to i mean could i get away with a normal stem or do i have to think of a more distal fitting stem and and then that previous track the previous track of course in this case is dhs but many avian cases there's a fibula strut over there and when i look at that then i have to think about whether that fibula then i have to be careful to remove that fibula with a nibbler or a osteotome before i start reaming and rasping so the literature review was all uh, they came out with these three complications all across the board infection dislocation and fracture my plan was to do a thr at that time i decided to do an uncemented with the understanding that if I mean, the the hip was uh, the the offset on the other side is fairly predictable so um, i did not uh, anticipate uh, that the uncemented stem will have any problem in creating the offset so i said i'll go with an uncemented stem and uh, but if i did not have any i mean if i didn't have a proper press fit with the trial and if there was any doubt i would add a very low threshold to shift to a cemented retrospectively now maybe i would have not kept an uncemented at all and gone with a cemented and my plan was to make sure that the tip of the stem went beyond the last uh, screw hole and this is my post op x ray okay so did you do any templating for this particular case i did manual templating i don't have those uh, pictures with me okay so i think it's a well done uh, hip uh, and uh, you know any particular uh, challenges uh, on uh, exposure with the previous scar no because uh, that was uh, all closed so the, the i did not go through the previous scar i took a separate incision i went through the posterior approach so without template any why did you sorry yeah j- just i wanted to ask how were you sure that you have crossed the last hole because that becomes sometimes so in these stems either we want to be above the last hole or below the last hole but not at the hole maybe these screw holes do not need two dimensions of the diameter at that level to be bypassed in a dhs but you should not end at that hole is a worry at times so without templating it- no i did a template i don't have the picture yeah. i did it manually you, you did a template yeah whether you were cross or not yes why did you say retrospectively i would have kept a cemented stem uh, so because it's a job it's a wonderful stem to use yeah uh, so and on 10 times i would do this again and again <laughs> nickel, no the uh, nickel 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 that, nickel, 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 that bone that yeah. bone is you know if that bone is weaker than the bone which we would see in a normal hip replacement and 
and if uh, yeah, in I, fact, I, I, would I would say. In fact, I would say trying to do a cemented in a setup where we are not used to plugging those holes with screw heads and trying to prevent the uh, cement leakage and maintaining the closed canal while you do a good good cementing. So too many variables. And maybe this, which you did, was more reproducible in your setup and in your hand. I mean, spot on. It's a, it's a Dore femur. I mean, you would be. Yeah. I mean, I, I I would do it time and again. I would do the same thing. I've done the same thing. It's just not a thought in my mind at all. But so we have Nikhil and Sanchit to let us believe in cement, but that doesn't mean that we hundred percent get sold to cement. Uh, it. I mean, I think there is. It, I would agree with you that it's absolutely fine. I, I think the argument between cemented and uncemented has gone. It's whatever works in your hands. Both have excellent survivorship. Um, it's there are there is evidence for the cemented stem and lots of it. Again, if philosophically, this is a well done hip replacement. I would go with the cemented stem, but that's not to say that uncemented stem is a wrong thing to do. I think Agreed. it's perfectly fine. The uh, only the thing QD was whether you should have done if it was your case. Would you have done it single stage DHS removal with this or not? That's my only question to you. Yeah, I would have done it a single stage, definitely. And what is your worry with infection if you do it a single stage? Well, I mean, I would just uh, check okay. the markers and if on table, if everything is looking pristine and clean, so I what, would just go ahead. What we would advise is when we do as a single stage, we do it like a two stage revision. So when we go in, we remove the implants, do a good, we call it a septosol wash, which has got all those local agents like chlorex and betadine and some dilute peroxide we mix and uh, we redrape the patient so it's something like handling an infected hip although it is not known to be infected here so any implant removals in our hands gets uh, this a 20 minute wash a change of drape so you the incidence of infection in this kind of a thing is somewhere about eight to nine percent if you serially subculture all the samples that you take yeah. And not afford to be complacent about it. Just as Vikas said, better go ahead and treat it like like you were doing an infection. What Very about uh, what about stimulant? I mean, is that uh, is that I would so say, there is use there is conflicting literature about it. We uh, five in maybe ten years back, we used a lot of stimulant because it has just come in. It was uh, the flavor of the time, and we loaded it with antibiotics. Still, there is evidence that you, local delivery is good. But there was some literature which came in where they comp compared a DAI procedure with or without stimulant and it did not reveal uh, a better result. So from that time onwards, because of the cost issue also, a single stimulant packet is 20,000. We are using it very selectively, but the belief in it is kind of going down. There have been uh, cases where even with stimulant, it has persist infection has persisted. So I would not say that it is out. It is a way of delivering local antibiotic. It may have a role, but not really proven in literature. I don't know whether, what does the panel have to say about their, Did you say 20,000? Uh, rupees. For one packet of stimulants? Yes, yes, yes. 10 ml. I've, I've got a cheaper alternative if you're interested. So, uh, so you can tell Antibiotic us. Antibiotic loaded cement. <laughs> but you know, you know, one good thing of these webinars and having Sanchit and Nikhil is in our country, we need such speakers to come in and convince most of us that yes, because uh, because of the influence of uh, the Americans in the West, in our country, somehow uncemented is really, really popular. And I think, uh, yeah, that's a well done hip. And uh, one point about the stress risers is that, you know, the there is a stem called the Wagner cone. Uh, and you know probably that uh, if you use that sort of a sort of a, a design and philosophy then there may not be so many uh, issues about the stress riser because of the length of the of the wagner cone so i think uh, let's go to the next uh, speaker uh, now i have a couple of points about this one yes please uh, yeah. i just wanted to share just wanted to share about one that you know the dhs crack can be sometimes very troublesome when you when you're trying to prepare your proximal femur, you need to have some burrs and long drill bits ready, readily available with you uh, to deal with those uh, sclerotic tracks. Otherwise, your brooches will deviate, and you might land up with a hydrogenic fracture. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That is one, and uh, that is something uh, you know you learn over the years. And the second point was, a proximal stem in this case may be a little bit of a concern because the proximal bone is compromised in terms of integration potential. So yeah. 
may uh, that is something which pro is, is probably open to debate but i would be very concerned about using only a proximal uh, coded stem maybe a corail yes but uh, proximally coded so, stem integration may be questionable i hope it works that's all i can say yeah so i agree with narinder here that uh, it could be a challenge with that track because a double you have used a double taper stem so double taper stem needs cortex to as we discussed in a previous webinar it needs cortex to cortex hitting and support for the primary stability and then it ingrows and at times in trying to do that uh, periprosthetic fracture rate and risk of there are issues in that but uh, as narinder pointed out either a corai which does not need cortex to cortex hitting you can have the cancellous bone around or a triple taper like a synergy which is can all fill and fit so you don't have to oversize and land up with uh, that issue so here it has it, it must have worked but that is a concern which remains i think it's time to move to the next case and while the other speaker sets up uh, the uh, point which qd mentioned about a bipolar i don't think uh, would have been suitable here because if you look closely the astabulum doesn't look that healthy so i think uh, what he did was right and uh, it was very uh, elegant i think uh, any I think any yeah, avian yes. uh, bipolar should not be done Yes, yeah. I think you know. I think there are people still, still uh, definitely not a bipolar. So younger, younger. But, you patient. know, there is a, in 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 India. I see bipolars all the time being done for. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, QD. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Prasad. Uh, Dr. Pradeep. Dr. Pradeep, Pradeep, are you ready? Pradeep, uh, we cannot hear it. Are you muted? No. If uh, Dr. Pradeep is not ready, then uh, Dr. Santosh Kumar is ready. I think Pradeep, are you able to hear us? Acha, Pradeep is sharing it. Pradeep screen is ready, boss. Okay, so yeah. please unmute yourself, Dr. Pradeep, and uh, please unmute. Dr. Pradeep is a very uh, experienced uh, armed forces uh, orthopedic surgeon, and uh, he will share his case, which is a complex primary THR in a failed IT. Am I uh, audible there? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but but not very loud. Not very loud. Little louder, I think. You can uh, get the microphone too. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, and uh, my sincere thanks to uh, all the faculty and organizers of this meeting. Uh, Your I volume is a bit low. Can you just uh, speak low. a bit loudly? I'll make it. Maybe you can speak loudly because the rest of the things are okay. I think is microphone is working. Oh, uh, my case is uh, complex primary THR in a failed uh, endotrochantic fracture femur. So, uh, it might, might be good idea to go to slide show. Everybody yeah. knows what to expect, unfortunately, with this. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, patient is a 77 year old male who is a retired army person. Is a known case of uh, hypertension, diabetes, bronchial asthma, and osteoarthritis, both knees. Hypertension and uh, diabetes, these are uh, well controlled. Patient is educated and uh, compliance is good. And as you know, in elderly patients, these are two common associations, osteoarthritis and uh, breaking the hip. He sustained this IT fracture left femur in November 2017 after a fall from uh, bicycle. Who, uh, he himself was uh, riding the bike. So uh, PFNA was done for him and he was doing well. He was recovering well for around, uh, around one year. He was uh, feeling that his pain is reducing, but uh, he was uh, always taking help of single stick. In uh, November 2018, he had new onset of pain in the left hip. So, uh, so now retrospectively, when we see that this if this fixation is failed, then we can see that this was a kind of suboptimal reduction. This gap here and neck is built this way. I think that was the reason. He was a smoker, two cigarettes per day. So uh, he presented with this pain uh, in the hip joint, then limb shortening, which was uh, because of virus deformity, and palpable implant. This, you can see the ballooning of the soft tissue here, bursa formation. So uh, I planned it this way, that uh, should we go for the refixation or arthroplasty, uh, considering his age, comorbidities, and bone stock compromise proximally, 
I decided for the orthoplasty. And in orthoplasty, what ME or THR? Uh, considering life expectancy more than seven to 10 years and his demand, he being a community uh, ambulator, I decided for total hip replacement, though his acetabular cartilage was pristine. So what in total hip replacement, cemented or uncemented? Uh, bone quality, I would say his door uh, was uh, type, type uh, door A uh, femur. I'm more uh, comfortable in cemented stem. Cost is not a concern for our hospital because uh, the surgeries are performed out uh, kind of uh, free of cost for uh, all armed forces patients. And uh, with cement, there may be concern of cement pressurization and fracture site penetration. So I went for uncemented stem. Stem option mentioned for uh, uncemented uh, options are metaphyseal fit with calcar replacing or structural bone with structural bone graft. The, the advantages are these. Uh, stems may be having anatomic bow, so it is not going to touch on the anterior co uh, cortex. But uh, metaphyseal bone, the proximal bone is already compromised, and how much the what will be will be getting from calcar. So I went for the diaphyseal fit, that is Wagner straight. This is a straight stem, and sometimes it may touch on the anterior cortex that we have seen to uh, templating. By contact and S room kind of modular stems are, uh, I think, overdue. Socket because uh, uh, acetabulum was uh, pristine, so any primary cup will do. But uh, because of fracture situation and weak abductor mechanism, I went for BM. So uh, can you share us the X-ray, please? Uh, this was the templating. Uh, infection markers were ruled out. This was the templating. Uh, acetabulum was uh, fairly standard templating. Main was this uh, being the stem. I wanted to bypass this uh, screw to cortices and even this uh, uh, kind of ballooning of the cortex. So I decided for 225 stem. And where I should enter and then GP deconstruction, my, these were the concerns. Templating uh, uh, Wagner stem was 14 into 225 and shell was 54. So standard posterolateral approach, dislocated, I dislocated the uh, hip along with the implant, and then I did the implant removal, then socket was prepared. While preparing stem, I kept the CM to see uh, if it is touching on anterior cortex, then did the GP reconstruction, and hip was stable and limb length was restored. So I achieved this. This was Wagner uh, 15 225. DM was 56 and head 28 minus 2. So this I could achieve. Wagner is a mid-fit stem. I think I am okay with this. I reconstructed with single SS wire. I think it could be a more SS wire, but I used two SE wounds also. Okay. So uh, this is two-year follow-up. I am sorry for this kind of uh, video. Patient is walking well. He is uh, walking three kilometers daily and Though later he came to us for TKR also, and now he's due for uh, TKR for other, other side. So this wire is broken, but I checked his abductor bar that is 5 by 5, and he's not having any. That's uh, very good. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep. Uh, uh, can you just uh, come back to the post op x ray? That's good, yeah. So I think that's a fairly good reconstruction using the dual mobility, uh, you know, cup. So my talk, my question to Sanchit is, uh, you know, which uh, dual mobility you use uh, in in your practice, and how would you reconstruct the uh, the greater trochanter? So um, I would we uh, use the striker dual mobility, and now we've got the the Pui one, which is the biomentum. So that gives us a bit more cemented option as well. In terms of the trochanteric reconstruction, I usually use a plate, a hook plate. So it's either the Synthes hook plate or the Zimmer GTR plate. And what we've tended to call it is it's a traumaplasty. So it's trauma surgery along with arthroplasty. So reconstructing the trochanter is as important as, um, I mean, I think your patient is walking well, so everything seems to be fine, but the trochanteric escape is quite a significant problem and that can lead to instability as well. 
plus the compromised function. So I would use a hook plate to reconstruct the trochanter. You put the hook plate on with the trial rasp in and then position the trochanter where it needs to be. And then you can just fix it with one or two screws while the rasp is in. And so once you fix that, your trochanter is sorted, then you take the rasp out and then put the cemented stem in or whatever you prefer. In this case, if you chose an uncemented stem, um, again, you put the trial in and then put the plate on with one or two screws and then you're sorted. And we've yet to see a trochanter escape. It allows you to take a big chunk of the trochanter and retain it and the abductor function is fantastic. Absolutely. I think this case, uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, got away with it, but uh, one wire is quite flimsy and it invariably breaks. And if the uh, trochanter escapes, then the result can be compromised. Uh, uh, Gurinder? Um, um, yeah, I think you know, the, the, the wiring technique, Pradeep, could have been, could have been better. Your wire is very thin and you need to take, you actually need to make it go, even if you want to persist with your wiring, you need to take it circumferentially as well around the around the shaft. Just doing this was, is, is unlikely, unlikely to work. What is the gap between the first fracture fixation and the second one and the sur surgery? Was it a year? So that was around the GT already united or not united? This is around uh, 14 months. One part of the GT, it was uh, uniting. The tip, tip, it was not uniting. But, uh, and you went from the back or you went from the front? Uh, uh, you went from the back, didn't you? Yeah. I went from the back uh, posterior side. Posterior side. Yeah, so, so I think it's just a, I mean, I would err on the side of the different fixation technique. I have no hesitation in using a, a, a Wagner in, in, in this kind of a scenario. Yeah, I mean, the stem and the cup is, is fantastic, but the fantastic. reconstruction option, uh, you know, we can uh, sort yeah, of we, discuss that. Um, yeah. Any other points, Vikas? Yeah, just, a, just, a, uh, just to comments one, that gradually we have moved away from this monoblock uh, DM design for uh, some issues, but we are, as uh, Sanchit is using we are using more of striker dual mobility and now the zimmer is also coming with the g7 dm so modular dms are becoming available and little more user friendly so that is one because these are stiff monoblock cups not allowing us to check the seating and being stiff there are issues in getting a good fit yeah the so, spikes uh, all, you know, yeah. come in the way and, and the serrations and this so, yes. so that we are writing a paper on it of our experience with this cup so other thing which I would like to say is, unlike uh, what Sanchit and Dr. Gurinder mentioned that if it is a chronic situation and usually the abductor mechanism continuity is more important than bone healing, which we have felt it could be different. But uh, in our revisions, we have had, we used to use GTR in, from 2008 to 13 and we had issues of uh, infection, which was a little higher and uh, damage to the soft tissue and abductor, which could be more than just using some simple reconstruct techniques like a better wiring. But yes, that, that it, he could have had a better wiring. But uh, usually, if it is a chronic situation with a sleeve fibrosed and intact, we would not struggle to get uh, the fragment to sit where it should and get a plate in to get an osteosynthesis. Yeah, in an uh, acute kind of a setting where a GT has... Uh, fractured per op or something, it is a different situation altogether. So uh, a continuity of abductor, when it, in this case, I don't know exactly whether this GT happened on table. Uh, if it was a GT which was kind of partially united and the abductor sleeve was intact, we may not uh, advise to use a, a GTR always. So that's a little different thought process which we follow. Yeah, I mean, obviously a fresh fracture, you know, and, and yeah. uh, partially united GT you know, is thing, but and know, our experiences, even with the GT not sitting exactly there, the abductors at uh, ends are functioning well, and maybe. So, uh, yeah, but the thing is, you know, we can certainly, uh, you know, if we are using wires, and there are various yeah, so, techniques to use the wire, where it, it is more robust than than this particular technique. But uh, you know, in the yeah, end, right. uh, the idea is to you know maintain the integrity and to restore it or reconstruct it in in a robust mm -hmm. way. Uh, if, we, if we pass these wires yeah. uh, through, through other thing stem, i wanted to just highlight although pradeep has because of the panel uh, he has uh, discussed the cemented option but here is something where i would uh, desist from advising a cemented construct where proximal bone loss is quite a bit and going long cemented stem which is a cobalt chrome stiff stem cantilevering failure these are an issue of cemented constructs un unless you use something like a modular cemented which is a mp reconstruction stem which is stiffer on top and may be able to take the load even with a proximal bone loss. 
but uh, I mean, a standard long this, thin yeah, cement there is no doubt that uh, you know uh, there are challenges with that but what would sanchit say i mean in your practice would you uh, i would use a long exit <laughs> there you are uh, maybe the again, metal, yeah it's with so, the long exit the, the one of the advantages with a long cemented stem especially if you're using a plate is you can get the screws very easily by the side of it because it's a, with a tapered stem um and again it's a it's a very cheap reconstruction elderly so most of the patients that we see in this spectrum are elderly and their bone quality is not great wow, plus with a compromised bone you're trying to fit in an uncemented long stem and that can be pretty tricky so but it, like like i said i think it's it's just personal preferences i don't think i'm going to sit here and be as yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no but in our country trochanteric fractures with high oh, speed traffic it, can in happen in relatively but, but what what uh, vikas is we must note and the message should go is that you know a, a cemented long stem stem etc is economic sense as well and uh, reconstruction can be done with it as well so yeah just one not small point that if you have to use you, you have to use a good metallurgy etc because lot of local stems are being used which are coming coming in broken yes uh -huh. that's right that's right so it has to be a proper uh, you know long stem revision type kiran a kiran yeah. a long a, a long stem etc with maybe two packages of cement is not any more economical than a wagner in today's price in india that's fair enough but i just request, i just I have a question comment uh, comment from the faculty if we pass these wires from the uh, the holes available in proximal part of the stem will it achieve the robust fixation which will, will it help in some way wagner has those holes anything I mean, which which keeps it there in a so wagner has holes yes you can yeah, do that yeah. and you can uh, in addition so just not one loop you could use two loops because it gives you a better fixation anything which improves your after your, this your, case i think i i used two three uh, wires this was a kind of first yeah. second if you see the lateral view this wire is hardly holding uh, and what gurinder was mentioning is that you know you got to wrap it around properly so you got yeah, to go anteriorly as well and then yes. you know make a figure of eight and use right. at least two or maybe three wires but if you want to use wires but uh, a, a robust plate which are low profile and you know trochanteric plates are probably you know more robust so vishal you got a point to make yeah i was it's an excellent uh, surgery turn i just wanted to ask the faculty the panel that would you worry about subsidence with the with the with the, this implant or uh, would you have preferred a slightly uh, more distal fit uh, with this one this is going to be a loss isn't it this is a very yeah this oh, is quite a well fitting wagner i think you yeah. hardly can see any space around this stem And, uh, okay, but is it also has lines? Still, Prashant, yeah, this has... is a this is a straight stem Wagner. This okay. is not going to go anywhere. It's mm. in a curve, curved curved okay. uh, femur. This is not going to go anywhere. It, it really sticks mm. inside and stays inside. Yeah. And there are splines okay. here also, so that also gives it a double fixation. And the sizing is probably appropriate in this particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Very, in mm. templating, oh, it was fourteen. I went for fifteen. Subsidence is known for the Wagner, but I think it is a mid fit stem, and I assume that. Uh, yeah, that's and what I want to know. Is it a distal fit minute. or a mid fit? Unlike okay. the unlike the full coat stems. cylindrical stems mm -hmm. this tolerates 2 to 3 mm of subsidence in fact uh, it the fit, fit improves with a little bit of subsidence so mm -hmm. that is another advantage as against the scratch fit stems which if they sink they are gone i just wanted to ask if anyone would use a bipolar in this no what age 25 high demand i think demand is high the old person the acetabulum appears uh, quite well preserved doesn't appear to be damaged but Uh, he is a high demand person he is not a home ambulator he is a community ambulator and although he is 75 but he is a army man now is i mentioned this would, would gurinder do a bipolar or sanchit do a bipolar here uh, my take on this is a bipolar is on the cards because the the, the femoral head looked normal the acetabulum looked normal he, at the end of the day a uh, it fracture in a 75 year old corresponds to osteoporosis corresponds to body generalized body dysfunction developing whatever you can say what you can but i can tell you bipolar would also have worked quite well much lesser chances of dislocation but with dwell mobility sanchit what would you think 
again, I, I can understand the reasoning. I, I would do a, personally, again, I would do a total hip. And, uh, I wouldn't want to go back into this hip ever again. And, and second thing was, that was a very unusual way of a PFNA failing. Uh, if you go back to the pre-op x-rays, I, I don't think that's a very common way of uh, PFNA fracturing like that. That would be yeah. something which synthes can look at. I'm sure that's our original synthes implant. Not we recently had another one. Is it synthes? Yeah, it is yeah, synthes yeah, and we had a exactly similar one happening at two years. Which we posted. So no that's something which probably synthes should be looking at. It's not, I think what happens is the implant is, if it has held a fracture for two years, like in this case one, and we had another two years, it served its purpose. The proper pro problem as pointed out with by Pradeep and in some cases is that bony apposition and the biology and the healing has not happened. So if an implant can hold for two years, it has done its bit. Now the bone should have united for whatever reasons, whether it was reduction, whether it was biology, whether it was alignment, whether it was the, the, uh, the metabolic parameters of the patient. All these, because here the fixation looks fantastic. The reduction, although Pradeep says is slightly dubious, totally acceptable. The but it's not so bad. So, so what I'm trying to say is that there is something working here and it's not the implant design or metallurgy because it's held for two years in a high yeah. demand individual. The, the blade didn't slide. That's the problem. The helical blade did not slide. It should have slided, uh, it slided, it broke there. That, but that's, it is, but that's why it failed. Contact that's is it. there. If contact is there, but and there, it is, it, there is a slide. It should have backed out further. It has backed out. Uh, Sanchit, uh, uh, in your practice, do you use uh, uh, any uh, medication or uh, therapy to uh, you know uh, enhance the bone quality after uh, such fixation? So I think, again, if they've been on bisphosphonates, we stop them and uh, then consider teriparatide. But uh, this further down, I mean, I think that's more for the atypical fractures or the bisphosphonate fractures more than anything else. Um, I know teriparatide is not that commonly used in India. No, it is very much common. It is used now. Yeah. Okay. Kiran, so, the surgeon is only going to see the patient once or twice in UK. The, the patient is going to be seen by the by his physician who's going to refer it to endocrinologist, who's going to consider teriparatide not by the time it's six months time. It's oh, so Dorinda. different. It's, it's, it's moved on a bit. I think <laughs> <laughs> now with also geriatricians, we can start it fairly quickly. <laughs> okay. So the last uh, presentation is by Dr. Santosh. Are you ready? Uh, until, uh, Dr. Santosh, yes, Dr. Dr. Kiran, I'm ready. Yeah, please uh, share your screen. Dr. Pratik, yeah, stop it. sharing. So, Dr. Santosh is also from the arm poses and uh, background noise. He's going to share his uh, fracture neck case. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Kiran and the organizers, for providing an opportunity to be on uh, Arthroplasty Conclave on live. Uh, my endeavor in presenting these cases is to give an outline of uh, decision making in fraction of femur. Most of our cases may not be uh, as uh, complex and uh, difficult as the previous uh, speakers have shown. But uh, here we would like to uh, uh, detail upon uh, how to go about uh, fracture neck of female cases. So, my first case is a classical uh, Indian grandmother, 74 year old, uh, with a history of fall at home. She presented with uh, inability to move the left hip uh, with pain. And, uh, clinically, the limb was incontrolled and shortened. She was a community ambulator uh, in her pre fall period and uh, she was a short stature lady. Luckily for us, she didn't have uh, uh, any comorbidities, uh, so anesthesiologists were happy to take her up uh, in ISA grade 2. So, the decision making, uh, uh, of course, so the same uh, similar slides will be slashed in the subsequent two cases as well. 
when I can do a HRA or a THR. As an institutional policy, we uh, generally tend to do a THR in uh, not showing patients from 60 onwards. The HRA we reserve for uh, the patients with uh, more comorbidities uh, who are not having uh, preoperative groin pain and uh, those who are more than uh, 80. And uh, there was a recent systematic review uh, published in 2019 uh, in the Journal of Arthroplasty uh, from Australia, which do recommend uh, uh, HRA in uh, more than 80 with uh, uh, life expectancy less than four years. Uh, whereas they, they do recommend that THR for uh, most of the uh, patients uh, less than 80 years with uh, life, uh, life expectancy more than four years. And uh, whether to go for cemented or uncemented, I think uh, we have a right mix of panel with us. We have, we have made the message loud and clear. So both should work well. Uh, we are lucky to be in, uh, working in centers where we are, uh, our armamentarium is equipped with both uh, cemented and uncemented. Uh, this lady uh, being a, uh, a kind of uh, osteo clinic uh, with a wide canal, as uh, you can see in the X-ray, we decided to go with uh, cemented uh, THR in this. Now, on the assembler side, uh, we did decide upon uh, going about with a dual mobility cut. Uh, as most of the uh, studies from the France, uh, Amir used to profess uh, regarding using uh, of a dual mobility cup in order to reduce the risk of uh, instability, prostatic instability postoperatively. And of course, uh, it has gained quite a popularity and recognition uh, globally now in uh, certain set of patients. So, uh, this patient, when you communicate ambulator, short station lady with a small uh, stabulum, uh, we thought it's uh, good to go with uh, dual mobility cup. The approach, uh, of course. Um, uh, Can you uh, go to the post op, please, because we have lack of time. So, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. I understand. So this was it uh, in the post op. Uh, uh, we uh, sorry. Yeah, here we went. Uh, this is uh, my mistake. Uh, pardon me. Uh, here we went with um, the uncemented one uh, with a dual mobility um, a standard first generation cup and a synergy stem. Uh, okay, just stop there. Just go back. Uh, Sanchit, uh, uh, any particular uh, comments to make on this uh, x-ray? Okay, there's no cement. <laughs> there's no cement. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's, 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 a, it's a well done hip. Uh, you, yeah. you use the synergy stem for any particular reason? Well, this was available in our inventory and it being a bipolar, uh, uh, sorry, uh, triple tip stem, we thought it would be uh, better to go with uh, uh, the synergy here. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. Gurinder, any Does panel have any other uh, suggestions or comments? No, she's got a, she's got a door A kind of femur, which uh, I can help Nikhil revise the revise the classification whenever he wishes. Uh, it's 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 a proven classification, so I think we should have read it. But okay, it's a Dore kind of female for me. I think I've, I've got nothing wrong with the idea. I would have I would have done either, in the sense. I mean, if you, I think uh, Sanchez would be familiar with the, with the Cardiff uh, um, uh, Cardiff paper, which actually showed the economics don't work out any different. When you put on the cement spacer and the restrictor and everything, the economics are not much different cemented and uncemented stems. This is the perfectly well done, beautifully executed uh, uh, hip replacement. Uh, full marks to the surgeon. Yeah, you bottomed out the cup well and uh, offsets and everything are recreated properly. Uh, in the approach, did you uh, you know preserve the capsule or uh, did you close it? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not the primary surgeon who did this surgery. This was uh, uh, done by Dr. Prushesh, who's on our panel. Uh, so, okay, let's go for the next case quickly because I think we don't have much time now. So, um, so the pre op uh, and the post op. Uh, the second lady is again a uh, old lady, 18 year old. Yeah, but the next little comorbidities. Okay. So uh, here we went ahead with the cemented one as a shared wide canal and uh, here we use modular one. This was done in uh, our center uh, and of course uh, she is doing well post-operatively. So yes, uh, uh, any comments Gurinder on this? So for me it's 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 a more cylindrical kind of a kind of, kind of a shaft that you can see. So the uh, the, the cup placement is, is, is absolutely fine. I think there is uh, uh, 
you know, I mean, I like the idea of leaving, leaving a little bit of cancellous bone on the on the medial aspect, which we discussed the other day as well. I mean, that gives you a perfect interdigitation for the for the, for the cement in there. The the length and all has been restored. The offset seems fairly good. How, how, how do you, the only only worry is overhang, which has been left because the cup's been put slightly more horizontal. It can actually, you know, impinge uh, in the in the front of the muscles, give rise to some some kind of problem. I think the, the surgeon got a little bit too scared about chances of dislocation. That's not. A, I mean, so you know, if you're going to get too too worried about dislocation, much better to use a larger head or a dual mobility kind of stuff. But sometimes you go overboard and you make the cup really really horizontal. Not a great idea. Um, and you know, because is... you know, two cups, go, two screws going so well in there. The cup has to be horizontal. Uh, any uh, points, Sanchit? In your practice, you are also a hybrid uh, THR guy. So, uh, all the points that Gurinder made that I think the cup could do the psoas pain on the anterior impingement is a particular problem, and we've had to go in with some hips uh, and do an arthroscopic psoas release on these. So, that would be a worry, although I completely understand the reasons why it probably was done. The zone one cement probably again could be a good better and there is varying debate about whether you preserve the bone there but I think the zone one is quite crucial and then that would again goes further back whether the introducer sort of hit the great trochanter and stopped you moving the stem into further sort of lateralizing the shoulder. Yes I yeah. mean that is an important point because this case illustrates that cement mantle in that area and and uh, you know like you know you talking about it and your x-rays and Professor Ross uh, you know talk to us on Sunday. I think the crucial thing is the uh, introducer yes. and how you get the stem in so that you preserve some cement mantle uh, on that uh, zone one. So I think uh, we have covered everything. Uh, any particular burning points remaining, Surendra? Uh, only for the previous case where there's a broken PFN, uh, the idea of doing a dual mobility was very good. I want to understand what you do with the lesser trochanter in a previous, uh, in a, as a first, as an index surgery only. Many times the lesser trochanter has got a sharp edges and it can cause an interference or it can cause an irritation to the femoral nerve anteriorly, the anterior, the branch of the femoral nerve. So do, in the second case, once after the second, conversion THR also, do you think that we should take it out and keep it clean or is it okay to stay there? It will be difficult to chase that. Chase uh, that with the ileus was attached. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. is, is that the key proposition? So I think uh, uh, I'll thank Sanchit uh, for his uh, participation and all the panelists, Gurinder, Narendra, Vikas, and uh, all the speakers for today's program. Uh, and uh, I would uh, say thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to the next uh, upcoming sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ashok. Thank you, Ashok. Ashok is not there, I think. He's not tired because of our discussion. You were particular about the time. It's exactly 9 o'clock and we really uh, stretched it today. So oh, It is good. Uh, all the presenters presented very well. Yes, uh, nice all good you. cases. And Sanchit, your work is phenomenal. And uh, Sanchit, you know, we are very happy nice that you could with you. Uh, share your yeah. experience with us. Great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks really enjoyed. I think uh, Ashok is <laughs> probably. I'm here. Okay, Ashok. So thank Ashok you very much. Sir. And thank you sir. can conclude the meeting. And uh, Sure. Great. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Stopping this. Bye.